so it's about time you got here. Well, so um, I came <laughs> here to use you, use, use you for some content. <laughs> Only joking. No, it is great to be here. I, I, I went through Mardi Gras, Mardi, I oh know, Nimbin once, years ago. I haven't been back to Queensland and Australia, really Australia for 12 years. Um, it's not because I've wanted to get away, but um, I live in Spain now where my wife is from and we had the TV show in America for a while. There were some legal situations I had years ago that... Um, became a pivotal part in my career as I transferred from Hollywood to the cannabis industry in California first. But, um, well, I start. Um, if I take some breaths, it's just because I'm, like, trying to monitor my heart rate. I've been out in the, um, the sun in the dog suit. It's hot. I breathe, I sweat through my tongue mostly these days, but... so. Yeah, so if you don't know, we did a short film called Wilfred back in uh, 2002, um, seven-minute short film. Uh, had sort of unprecedented success, won Trot Fest, a bunch of awards, Trot Fest, went to Sundance. Um, and with the money for that, we made a pilot for a TV series. Um, Comedy Channel picked it up at first. They said they were going to pick it up. They committed to it, but they're waiting for the financial budget for the next year to come in, so I wrote the whole series for Comedy Channel on spec, like waiting for this money to come in. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, financial year changed. I said, right, we get that Wilfred money. They said, no, they're not buying it now, right? So I just like ran up my cre credit cards, got evicted from my place. It took me a while to recover. Thankfully, SBS came along about a year later and saw the pilot and said, we, we've got to do it. And they said, um, let's see the scripts. We expected them to rewrite everything or want us to rewrite everything like often happens, but they just said, look, if we want to buy these scripts exactly as they're written. So I was like, sweet. So that kind of got me out of um, my financial strain that happened from <laughs> writing like Comedy Channel screwing us over. And then um, it, it went pretty well. Season one went pretty well in SBS, but then they weren't going to do another one. And then uh, a year passed and then the... Um, merchandise department said, you've got to get Wilfred back. It's the highest selling SBS DVD ever. Like, we've got to get it back for that. So, like, all right. So, Wilfred wasn't a particularly fun project for me to do in Australia. I wasn't, it wasn't ideal. I didn't like it that much, um, even though I'd created it. It wasn't fun, you know. It wasn't with, wasn't with people that shared my, uh, I don't know, ideologies, I guess. And so, I did some shit with Channel 10. That was more fun. But so, I did a season two of, of Wilfred. And then, I had an opportunity to go over to America. And uh, at first I just thought, look, I just want to sell the format of Wilfred. So they make an American version of it. And if they might let me be a staff writer on the show. So I'm like, um, I said, okay, you, we want you to be Wilfred. And Elijah Wood had been, um, well, wait, I, before that, I was in Australia and my American manager called me up. He said, look, I know you don't want to play Wilfred again. I said, I'm not getting that fucking dog suit again. He said, he, he said, hear me out. He said, this could be your Mork and Mindy. Uh, like the dog, like the alien, everyone's going to remember the dog. And whether the show's a hit or not, you're going to be able to walk into any room in Hollywood. I said, look, well, Mork and Mindy was my favorite show as a kid, so it's hard to argue against that. If you can sell it, I'll do it. So he sold it. I did it. Jump forward. We're writing season two. Elijah emails me. He says, I'm with Robin Williams. He's a huge fan of the show. He'd love to be in it. And uh, I was like, uh, <laughs> okay. I went in the writer's room. But I was a you know, one, head, one head writer. It wasn't the head writer. I wasn't the showrunner. But I walked in the writer's room and I said, Robin Williams wants to be in our show. The showrunner who was, uh, you know, high-level Hollywood narcissist said, well, there's nothing in it for him. There's nothing in it for him. It's like, look, all the characters written for this season. I said, I repeat, Robin Williams wants to be in our show. We've got to find something. We found something. We sent it to him. I didn't think he was, wanted to play an animal in it, but I didn't think he'd take this. Um, I thought he wouldn't take it, you know, because it was blow him. But he took it. He came on set, and it was the first television acting appearance Robin Williams did since Mork and Mindy. And so that was this coming to full circle. I told him that the only reason I took on Wilfred in America was because someone said Mork and Mindy. And I said that's hard to argue against. So, so when it comes to, then the show went for like, what, um, 
four seasons. So we did um, at 16 in Australia, 49, so 65 episodes all, all up. And then I was, um, how, long, how long have I got? I've still got a bit of time, right? So, I, so then I was writing scripts for, because um, I really didn't go there as an actor, you know, like I'd done that. I played Hamlet when I was 22. I, was on, I used to perform on stages like this, like I had a 20-year stage experience, which was actually where the, the dog idea came from. So I used to be backstage at these kids' shows, fucking Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, chicks yelling at Santa for being drunk on stage. We're ducking backstage, getting high, coming on as kangaroos, as emus, whatever. I always had the sa- stupid animal suits, but did the same freaking black nose and everything. So when, <laughs> when Adam was saying to me, what's Wilfred look like when we first wrote the short film? I said, oh, shit, I don't want to get one of those animal suits again, but I think I can get it for two days. To, I think he looks like this. So 22 years later, I'm still getting in the suit. And um, so what happened was when I finished the show, they said, Jason, take whatever props you want. Take whatever you want, costume or a dog suit. I'm like, fuck, I didn't think they'd let me have this. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking like, I always knew Wilford was, gonna, was most likely going to be more famous in the long term than as we were doing it, which is proven to be kind of, True, because I still get people write to me every day. They're just still discovering the show. And there's, there's bigger fans as the people that were in from day one. So it hasn't aged that much in that sense. So uh, you can flick th- oh, I can flick through this. I mean, these are just some of the products that I'm doing in, my, in America. That says Wilfred Cannabis under there. You can't really see it. What I'm going for here, I'll just jump to some industry talk. I'll get into how I got into the industry in a minute. But... Um, you think this would be simple? Oh, on here. Right, so, um, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, so they gave me these suits, and um, they gave me a suit and some shit. I thought, well, I'm going to keep this one day and it'll be worth something. I didn't know I was going to do this, though. So I, was, I sold maybe, oh, man, I would have sold like six or seven pilot scripts in Hollywood to studios, and, uh, but nothing was getting made. I didn't want to live in Los Angeles. <laughs> I was always, I hated the industry in that way. I was like, I was, I was a slave to Sydney or Melbourne, where the industry was, or Hollywood. And after that, it's like, I don't want to be here. Where, I looked everywhere around LA where I was going to settle down. I like, I can't live there. Can't live there. Can't grow old here. So I'm like, um, I need another business that I can live wherever I want. And then, um, and then one day I was thinking, I didn't have the rights to Wilfred at that point, And I'm like... I knew I was in California, I knew cannabis was legal there, and I'm like, well, I just put an ad out from the fans and saying, Wolf is weed delivery service. And I made it look like, I actually got a photo from the old um, SBS show where he's pulling that big bamboo bong. And it's like, Wolf is weed delivery service to your door. Yeah, like, remember the good old days when you didn't have all those difficult to- choices from dispensaries? Well, those, and you just, those days are back because what your dealer's got is what you're going to get. And Wolf is doing it, he's coming to your door. And for an extra hundred bucks, he'll pull a bong on your sofa. And so all my fans were like, American fans were like, um, the Australian fans were like, sell out. <laughs> I got a lot of shit from Australian fans when I went to America. I always say to them, are you with your first job still? You still at McDonald's? No, sell out. I could have earned more money working at McDonald's for a year than I would have ever earned at SBS doing Wilfred. So an artist should never have to deprive himself of an audience just because he's seeking a big audience. So, so where was I? Is anyone about the industry? Yeah, so, I, so they're like, we're going to do a road trip to, to America. We're going to do a road trip to California. We've got to smoke Wilfer's weed. I'm like, I've got a business here, right? I've got enough of a, we're in 35 countries. I've got enough of a cult audience to get on this. So I had to get the rights. So I went to FX uh, legal department. I said to them straight up, I said, look, have a look at my Wilford deal. It's terrible. I didn't know any better. I, I need another way to make money out of this franchise. And they were like, look, we've got a lot of love for you here at Wilfred, at the FX. Um, we never want to get in the way of what you want to do. So they gave me the rights. I've got a bunch of different rights for different things. But I've got the rights to use Wilfred, the character, in the uh, hemp and cannabis space. I went, right. So I, then I was about, what, what products am I going to do first? These weren't the first products... That's when I pivoted during the pandemic because I had a problem with my supply in California. I got a manufacturing license in California. I procured the flour. Every time I went to try and get someone else to do something, they'd want to charge me all this money. I'm like, oh, man, I, I could do this myself. 
So I got a manufacturing license. Um, these were put out in California in 2019. And as you can see, they might remind you of an old-fashioned uh, product available in Australia. They don't have that branding anymore. I say, we say fuck it, have a Wilfred. Um, so this, you got your Sativa, your Indica, and your Hybrids. And this is sort of my tribute to Australia. I was over in America, because the Americans didn't know this brand when, back in the 80s and 70s. But it was just my, like, wink, you know, to Australia. There's an eighth sun-grown flower. First potential partner wanted to charge me two, $2,000 for a pound of indoor. I'm like, well, see, I can't make, there's, there's no business there. So I found this sun-grown flower. It was like 25 to 28%. THC up in 100% sun-grown cannabis flower with no trim, no shake. A lot of pre-rolls at that time in particular had the reputation of being um, full of uh, shit, you know. The cannabis companies used their quality buds for, the, for um, jars and, and other things. So, yeah, um, we launched that in 420 in 2019. And then um, some things started happening, right, because I was... Like, I was living in Spain. I mentioned my wife's from there. And uh, it was like our man manufacturing partner there, he's like, oh, 25 pounds of flour is missing. I'm like, what? Yeah, the cultivator didn't deliver it. I call them up. Yeah, we delivered it. So I'm like, call the other guy up. Where is it? Well, the video camera cameras weren't working that day, and then it was a public holiday. We kind of lost track of it. We don't know what happened, but the, they didn't arrive. It's like stiff shit, you're in a dog suit in Spain, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, okay. So I took that hit. And then a little bit later, we had like 7,500 of these packs. And the flower had passed heavy metals testing, because the testing in California is quite um, stringent. But then something happened in the pre-roll process, where you're just simply putting it in a pre-roll, and suddenly it's, it's had um, arsenic in it, and... Um, Heavy metals. I spoke to uh, Josh from Raw Papers actually about it because he had some shit going on. You know Raw Papers? Like a tiny bit of like heavy metals and stuff from coming from the ground. Anyway, he said had some bullshit about it. But I, kn I knew him and I didn't want to create any problems. You know, I was like, oh, I'll mention it to him later on if I want a favour from him, but I'm not going to make a big deal about it. But still, I knew that there was no business to be made as long as people were stealing from me like that. I didn't have my boots on the ground. So I shifted um, business models to brand licensing. In California, um, it's, uh, you can't, cannabis can't cross state lines. So you have to have a different business um, entity in each state. So the, the, the brand licensing model is that uh, a licensed partner gets exclusive rights to the Wilfred cannabis brand. And, uh, and um, they give me a small royalty per product sold. It's not as much money if you've got the full production in there. But the idea is, you know, if, if I get in multiple states, it's 5K a month there, 5K a month there, you know, or 10K a month in 10 places, then suddenly it's going to grow. I had six brand licensing contracts in negotiation in six different states in America when the pandemic happened. I saw it coming. I saw it coming from fucking China. I tell, when everyone said it wasn't coming, I said, it's coming. I'm trying to get these deals done before it, everyone started panicking didn't happen and then everyone started panicking society collapsed for a while and um it, no one wanted to do new business deals they just want to consolidate what they had so uh that sucked for me but um and all, but one good thing was in america they made cannabis uh a, an essential item which no one saw coming and that gave us some real credibility and talking about a little bit later today in the panel about um culture and about uh you know talk about a, a little bit about um, the credibility, like the, the packaging and the shop, you know, sort of Apple Store type production in California, they're really trying to turn up market all the kind of cannabis industry to appeal to, you know, um, just sort of up market type markets. And so that and then the essential item stuff gave the cannabis some real notoriety, some real, you know, strength in the, in the community. It doesn't have that same stigma anymore that it still has here and many other places where it's kind of like, oh, you're still fucking criminals. So that was good there. But because I didn't get all these deals, I needed to survive. I wasn't making enough money from my Hollywood royalties to, to support my family. So 
I pivoted back onto these bad boys. And so in 2018, they just had this new farm bill in, in America where um, hemp was legal everywhere. And so I searched around. And I found the best guys, they, grew, they learned their trade up in Humboldt, but they lived in Tennessee. I was fortunate enough to spend two times in Tennessee in my life. 2000 and, um, 1987, I went there with my mum, visited, I loved it. And then in between the pilot of Wilfred, the um, American show on the TV show, I did some rehab there for um, early childhood trauma, PTSD, sex love addiction. So <laughs> I went through all that. That's another seminar. But so... These guys came, so why did I, why did I talk about that? <laughs> Fucking hell, that was a digression. Um, <laughs> Mark Wary, I don't know if you ever saw Mark Wary on Channel 10, it was him, his fault. Wilfred, the Wilfred fans were the bong smokers, the Mark Wary fans were the come in the cubicle fans. So, um, yeah, so Tennessee. So I thought, I love Tennessee. If there's a... If, if these guys are any good at all, I'm doing it because it's God's country. It's where I found a spiritual connection again. I would want to be in Tennessee. So that's where these guys are made. And they make them like cigarette packets. So for like 42K, I got 2,000 like tent. Like they, come, they go in as hemp. They come out as like 10 packets in a carton. Like the fucking old-fashioned ones. They just look like good to me. Like, yeah, so, so I guess those, a car, so a pack of them probably ends up costing about $2 something. They sell for, we're selling for forty ninety five for all the competitors, but I want to compete with tobacco. So I'm trying to, um, those, I need to bring those prices down. <laughs> Shit, a packet of smokes here, like 42 bucks or something. Well, in America, it's still about 10 bucks, 12 bucks. So I'm bringing um, the price of these down now, make less margin. And that's been a principle for the, the company all the way through is working class, so Wilfred's a working class dog. I have working class values. I, I don't claim to have the Mercedes Benz, but I'm going to take you where you want to go. And I, I want to keep the margin small, but I want to be in many pla- a lot of places. I'm not yet, but I'm getting closer. So, um, yeah, we did those things and um, the smokes. Then Delta 8. Um, I don't know if I've got any Delta 8 products there. I have, but that's not. Here we go. Ah. Uh, um, does anyone here know what Delta 8 is? Delta 8 THC? Yeah, well, I'm a big advocate of Delta 8 THC, and a lot of the cannabis community in America hang shit on it all the time. They try to discredit it and say that it's not fucking procured well, and that it's dangerous, and made in shitty labs and stuff. Most people don't know that it's actually been around since 1974. And 1974, they did tests between um, hemp derived THC, so it just gets you high. But it doesn't have the psychoactive effects and the anxiety often associated with it, right? And these studies back in 1974 said that delta, hemp-derived delta 8 THC is equivalent to two-thirds as potent as regular cannabis. A lot of stoners are like, it's weed light. I'm like, yeah. And light beer is good sometimes too. And a lot of girls in particular I've noticed don't want to, get, don't want to have gummies that put them on their ass and make them vulnerable. And people don't want to get wiped out. Anyone who's had edibles generally has one experience where they were fucking terrified and it was like, never want to do it again. And these guys aren't like that, right? So, and that's what happened was some genius realized that these hemp laws in America actually opened up the door to Delta 8. Cannabis THC is called Delta 9 THC. Hemp derived THC is called um, Delta 8 THC. So I'm a big advocate for this on a health level. Also, those studies in 1974 concluded that they had just as many, if not more, medicinal values than cannabis. Definitely helps with everything on the checklist, but what it doesn't do is make you anxious and give you paranoia. Now, if you've got PTSD or other serious psychological issues, sometimes weed isn't the best thing. I've spoken to a lot of people who've said, oh, I wish I could. Well, they came with this. So I would like to, at some point, try and introduce this to Australia in an effort to you know, help what I call something like, like self, self-medicating. 
In the rehab recovery rooms, I talk about self-medicating like it's a negative thing. Oh, you were, you were once medicating yourself because you had problems with drinking and medicating yourself with alcohol. So we're going to stop that and allow us to medicate you with these pharmaceuticals. That less than a year ago, the pharmaceutical companies have come out and has admitted this whole chemical imbalance marketing slogan they come up with in the late 70s was bullshit, not based on any fact. There's no, there's no serotonin chemical imbalance in anyone's brains and the pharmaceuticals aren't doing anything to balance it. But, you know, we're simple folk. We hear that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not a chemical imbalance. Yeah, give me these pills. And I've had my experiences on them. I'm not going to say there's no place for them, but, but here's what's happened. The, the pharmaceutical companies have admitted that they are not... Um, it was bullshit. They're not trying to hide it. They're not trying to lie about it. They're not saying it's misinformation. They're not saying it's conspiracy theory. They say nothing. Nothing. So everyone, 80% of people who are recently uh, questioned, all thought, yeah, chemical imbalance. So the whole pharmaceutical um, antidepressants that have been, they've been selling for years is all based on bullshit. Whereas medicinal cannabis is the real thing. Um, I just want to jump forward. I probably don't have much time. How much time have we got left? So there's two things I want to talk about. Australia, market. Sorry, you've got about another 20 minutes, oh, inclu okay. including questions. Okay. I want to talk about medicinal market, uh, market in Australia. And what do I nearly go back to? Oh, Yeah. There's an attack on cannabis in the media. I don't know what is happening in Australia. Pharmaceutical companies are obviously behind it. Um, I read the other day before I come over here this article, news article, in the Daily Mail, which I kind of find is generally kind of down the middle when it comes to politics left and right. You kind of get an even, at least, idea of what's really happening out there. Because as you know, it's often not the bullshit that's said. It's the shit that isn't said. It's look over there while something else is happening more important. So this article read, 15% more people in recent years, uh, you're, no, if, if you smoke cannabis, you're 15% more likely to have suicidal thoughts or actions. That's the headline. I thought, well, that's alarming. That's the kind of thing that when... In the industry in America, that normally happens, people are like, oh, fucking shut that shit down. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. But I look at it a bit differently. I'm like, okay, let's have the conversation. Let's talk about it. We've got to, we're going to have to take that on. You know, we can't just say that cannabis is this miracle thing. There's one fix. You know, sit there having dabs all day, buddy. You'll be fine. No, you won't. There's, there has to be some moderation, responsibility for your own personal health. So I'm like, hey, let's see, let's see before, I, before I accept it. 15% of you're more likely, 15 more likely to have um, suicidal thoughts or actions on cannabis. I want to compare that firstly to alcohol, and I also want to compare it to statistics of, of a combination of cannabis and other things. And I want to also know what the pandemic effect, ha, effect has had on that with lockdowns and stuff for the last three years. Let's let's look at the scale. Let's look at all the information. So I go through the um, <laughs> the article. It was really hard to find the link to, you know. Here it is, the link to the study, right? So I dive into the study. I get into these studies. Because often it's the interpretation of the studies that you get told rather than reading it for yourself. So I dig in this study. Sure enough, exactly what I wanted to find out was there. Every single cannabis-related suicidal thought or action that was spoken about in this test was a combination of alcohol or other drugs, Therefore, the test said, there, are no, there is no conclusive evidence that cannabis is directly related to suicidal thoughts or actions. It actually said in the study the very opposite of the headline in the article. Right? So, this is the shit that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to no, welcome the fight. Welcome the argument. I don't even think I've spoken about Cannabis Code. The Cannabis Code is... Uh, first, I'll talk about the... Um, uh, I'll just maybe, maybe I'll take some questions if anyone's got any, and then I can extrapolate another shit as I go along. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah, man. Is that working? Can I buy your products anywhere in the U.S.? 
Can you buy my products anywhere? Anywhere in the U.S. Um, yeah, look, I have retail partners, stores in 18 states, and then I've got, but these these guys, the these ones and uh, these ones, yeah, you can go to those ones, WilfredCBD.com. Gotcha. And that that's what I want to say. That's what saved my company because I was like, I was in lockdown in Spain, and. Um, when I could sell these for the first time, we didn't have to go through the licensing bullshit. We didn't have to go through um, all the, that kind of, oh, there's just so many hoops you have to jump through in, in California in the, in, the, in the legal cannabis market. So for the first time, fans were able to just go online, order some smokes, order some other shit, and they'd come straight to their door. So yeah, wilfordcbd.com. Cool, cool, thanks. Another one here. That's me at um, Hall of Flowers with some fan. I was creating content. <laughs> uh, that's me and my handsome days up against the rand. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I did. I've got this thing I've been working on for 10 years. Now, this is pretty out there. Um, when I got sober, I was sober for four, like through the whole of the American series actually till the last year and I was like, I just feel like it's time to smoke weed again. Like, and I just felt like my spirit was like yearning for something. Like I, I always used to feel like my relationship with cannabis was spiritual or something and it was like at different times in my life, I'd get high and it would feel like I'm in my life but I'm also looking at my life in context of my whole life and the universe and everything. It was like it's this spiritual like uh, confirmation. So I said to my therapist, I said, look, I'm thinking of smoking weed again. I don't see it like those other drugs. I told him about how my relationship with his spiritual. He said, I think you should do it. I did. So I got to enjoy the last season of Wilfred getting a bit high because, you know, all the Australian series, I wrote every episode high. A lot of the other writers in America were high, but I just thought, you know, I wanted to do the full sobriety to save my own life. So I, um, so... After this meeting, I started thinking, well, I keep telling everyone my relationship with cannabis is spiritual. What does that mean? And who, who else has said this? So I start like just Googling around and finding all these ancient um, religions used to use cannabis as an entheogen, as a, a tool to connect with a higher power, with a God. And I couldn't believe how many ancient cultures and civilization used cannabis all the information we anything you ever see in the documentary landscape is like oh prohibition from last hundred years or whatever but i started just thinking um there's got to be more here because I, I believe that cannabis has medicinal value as quantified by science i love i love that <laughs> but when i think about my depression that i've managed for 26 years every day I think that of it as a soul pain I knew it wasn't a chemical imbalance it was in here but something was missing something was there's a disconnect I often thought about how with the collapse of religions and stuff people just disconnected and like my best friend killed himself I had my own ba ongoing battles with suicidality for decades and I'm like we're disconnected but you know I would think about the old big day outs or the old livers where everyone's fucking high and everyone's connected everyone's connected to the music and that's what cannabis brings. And so I'm thinking this isn't a... Science can't yet quantify all of the medicinal values of cannabis. It has something that's spiritual, something that's celestial perhaps. And it's no coincidence, I don't think, that humans and cannabis are the only... Like two, I think the only species that don't have a direct ancestor. We don't have a direct ancestor. I was a missing link. We know we're apes and something else, extraterrestrials. But cannabis also doesn't, like the closest relatives, like the strawberry or something, right? So then I found about, do I run out of time? Uh, you still got about 10 minutes <coughs> with questions. And we do have another <coughs> question or two as well. All right. Let me just finish about the, mention the Dogon while I'm on this train of thought. And then I'm done and I'll answer any questions. So then I discovered about the Dogon tribe in Mali, Africa. The Dogon tribe have a mythology. I don't like that term. It's a misnomer because it assumes that ancient civilizations are all um, we're telling some sort of myth some sort of 30,000 year old prank just to fuck us over no people leave information for the future generations to help them and that's the story as they knew it and they were also 
their history gives some credence because they were able to predict the Sirius star system was a dual star system decades before modern telescopes and technology could confirm they were correct. Many ancient, you hear about them having an understanding of the planets, you probably heard of that. So the Dogon say that fish-like extraterrestrials came from the Sirius star system and among other things, they gave, uh, they gave the early hominoids cannabis to help with the, the, to expand their consciousness. Straight away, I'm like, expanding consciousness is what I'd say it does, is what it feels like. <laughs> I've only recently started talking about this, but in 1997, I had a direct contact with a conglomerate of extraterrestrial beings, which I believe were subterrestrial beings, and... Uh, interdimensional beings so to me accepting the extraterrestrial theory is no problem like I've been an ancient astronaut theorist for most of my life and especially since 1997 I've been trying to find as much as I could about these things so I'll leave it at that I've got a new show coming out it's called the cannabis code it's it's about this stuff it's about the mysteries hidden histories and the possible divine nature of the cannabis plant and that's sort of my passion as well as um, entering Wilfred into the medicinal market here hopefully Thanks. Okay, thank you, Wilfred. We've got a few questions to round it all off. Hi, my name's Alyssa. I'm here. I uh, was a federal candidate for Victoria and a state candidate for the Legalised Cannabis Party. And I ran because I have Tourette's syndrome. So I've utilised cannabis for the last 30 years. And Tourette's syndrome is a genetic neurological condition which sits along the spectrum. So we now know from studies that the endocannabinoid system is activated in vitro, which means we essentially are nutritionally deficient unless we continue that. So you are so on the right track. And all I can say is thank you as an Australian for utilising your um, character and your mind to expand to the world in such a simple way and to get that holistic knowledge across. And I'm sure I'd love to have a chat with you Thank about you. it more. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. And I really hope that we can actually bring this to <coughs> thousands of children that should be actually having their nutritional balance supplemented so that they don't have to go through the trauma that we've exposed in childhood trauma. Yeah. And thank you for discovering and thank helping you. us with the Delta Thank you for A. what you're doing too. Hello, Jason. My name, at the front, my name's Simone. I'm a cannabis prescriber. I would love to see your products here in Australia. The problem we have in Australia um, with regulation is the TGA banned Delta 8 mm. um, about two years ago. Mm. Um, and some of us in the industry are working hard to get them to oh, review that because while it was in Australia, it had a very valid place, especially in <coughs> aged care and things like that. So, yeah, keep pushing and we'd love to see you agitating with the TGA too. They, they do listen. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, that's um, one of the cool things about me being back here now. You know, like, I, have, I do have this um, character and platform that does connect with a lot of... Uh, Australians and um, you know I, I didn't do any of this I didn't set out to do any of this it's organic. like when I, we sat down to do the short film you know Zwari I was sleeping on his sofa pulling bongs he came home told me he came home from a powder finger date with this girl got all the way to her bedroom and there's this dog sitting on her, a sofa in her bedroom looking at her like what do you plan to do with my missus so I just started acting it out like Robert De Niro and meet the parents, you know, interrogating him. We went, fucking, that's a short film. We wrote it down. That weekend we shot it. Well, first, it just grew. And so when people talk about what I'm doing now, I say, um, I feel like I'm living what my dream would dream. <laughs> like, I never for a second thought that I was going to ever, like, look, I, I felt like I overachieved getting a, a, a TV show in America. But that was my dream as a kid. But then to think as like a you know, lifetime stoner that I could have my own cannabis company right, with my own face on it, all being in a dog suit, it's like, it's fuck, I've got to go for it. You know, like I've got to go for it. I've got to take this as far as I can. It's ridiculous. 
When I was in, uh, in America and I was, <laughs> Eliza was auditioning and uh, the showrunner decided he didn't want Eliza anymore even though he had, had dinner with him and he wanted these other guys and I'm like, we've got to get Eliza Wood. He's going to add a zero to my asking price, right? I've got to get Eliza Wood. And he's great. And so he, he signed on but there was actually two other people that also signed on. So they basically had the screen test where they do contracts with three actors and then they've got to get in there and they've got to win the role. And uh, so I got the dog suit for them for that audition. And I just thought, and I gave the other guys my best as well. I didn't think it was fair to give Elijah a great performance and just, you know, faxing it to the other guys. So I saw Elijah before I, he went in. He's like, you, what, you getting in the suit? And I'm like, yeah, mate, yeah, yeah, I'm getting in for you. He's like, oh, thank you, thank you. So I go to the... Um, I go to the bathroom and I see all these, we're at this, like the Twin, twa- the twin Towers in, in like Century City overlooking like all of LA and there's these big like ex-head of C, um, of ABC, all these big, big heavy bopper Hollywood types and I'm about to do it with Elijah Wood and I'm putting on this fucking old dog suit I'm like, this is a bad joke gone too far, like what the fuck is happening here, this is ridiculous, this is fucking ridiculous, but they're believing it. So I went in there, Elijah won the role. So I've got a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah. So so does does Wilfred like to does he like to trip on acid and mushrooms? Look I'm look, I, I have my own experiences in as a young guy, but um, as a a father of a couple of young kids these days. I, 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 that's not the experience for me. And I don't have the rights for Wilfred in the mushroom space, even though I've been approached several times to, to, to go into that market. Who has them? No one has them. You've got to get them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I only got two paws, you know, like there's only so, oh, four paws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need sidekicks. I've got a few sidekicks. But, you know, I had this situation, maybe some of you know, some of you don't. I had this uh, unfortunate incident at um, the Derby Day races back in, like, 2007 or something and had an altercation with the bus driver that, you know, was nothing like what was in the media. But I don't want to fucking ramble on about it. It's just not worth it. don't want to give it the energy. But, you know, I lost everything. Lost all my money. Had a shit deal in Hollywood as well. Lost everything. And I was just surviving on selling scripts and I was like, as time was going on, I wasn't selling any more scripts. I'm like, I'm running out of like cachet. Like I was getting paid less and less. I didn't want to be in LA anyway. And I'm like, it used to kill me to think that other, 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 people, other people's kids and grandkids are going to be seeing Wilfred money and my kids weren't because it was my idea. It was my character. I know there's lots of stories like that in Hollywood, but I wasn't determined not to be one of them and so I created this company as like a financial legacy to try and make money so I've had to bootstrap everything I've had the fucking ass out of my jeans the whole way I still got the ass out of my jeans I've still got a lot, a lot of I'm going from here to Chicago I've got a, a new Wilford operation in Illinois I've got a lot coming up but I'm just any money I've got is just strike but on the company oh well, we need to buy one of them just keep it going so I would never have done this and sometimes, you know, I'll say to my wife, you know, like, if all that shit hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing the cannabis company, which wouldn't have led to the activism, which wouldn't have led to the cannabis code. So this was always part of my destiny. And I don't, otherwise I'd be like making a lot of money in royalties, like making TV shows all the time. And I'd be like one of those fucking jerks in Hollywood that I hate. So I'm glad I'm not one of those jerks. Any more questions? Yeah, I think we're going to wind up anyway. We've got it for the next speaker. All so right. Thank you awesome. Guys. Thank you for coming it. to Thank Mardi Gras. You.